The chairs, chairs have been moved. You can oh, see that something's okay. going on. Okay. Some of the photos, some of the chairs are different, etc. But essentially, that's the death scene, and that's the end. That's the uh, the uh, um, the. Uh, this is, is the uh, this is the entryway right there, and this is right in the back here, and this is where Munoz and the girls are sitting. It's a relatively small bar, as you can see. Ruben's body will lie somewhere on the floor and towards the front. Um, inside, a large oversight spent the entire breath. Uh, the, the bar area where customers sat on wooden stools occupied almost half of the cafe in the center aisle stretch of the back exit. Um, when his, Ruben and his crew arrived at the Silver Dollar, uh, that's where Ruben sits. <coughs> right around in here, that's the doorway. You can see the distance there, just a few feet. Just a few feet. When are these photographs taken, like a day of? No, these photographs are probably taken a day or two later. Uh, this is the gas stuff, the rest of you, and what have you. Um, <laughs> I guess right there on the floor, is that where he fell? I can't tell, maybe. When Ruben and his crew were at the Silver Dollar, the immediate area was full of civilians, deputies, and firemen who were rushed in and converging, on, on, and, and con conversing in small groups. A fire truck was parked diagonally across the boulevard just east of the Silver Dollar, and another one was parked west of it with firemen sitting in their cab as they waited for something to happen. The hamburger stand was, was very busy serving the deputies and civilians alike, and the record store employees were loading merchandise into the cars and trucks and preparing to make a quick getaway while others carrying clubs and tire iron stood guard in front of the door. Their neighbor, the Bell Plastic Building, was gutted out by a roaring fire just an hour before. Guillermo noticed that a little bar was open and suggested that they have a beer and rest. But Ruben hesitated and replied, yeah, let's go in. Let's get off of the street. I have to use the restroom anyway. Before he went in, though, he hesitated and nervously looked around several times, and Guillermo asked him, ¿Qué pasa? What's wrong? He ignored him at first, but then blurted, I don't know. I guess I'm afraid, but, but maybe I'm stupid. Guillermo, I think somebody has been following us. Guillermo looked around several times and slowly replied, yeah, I know, I'm afraid too, let's go in. Unfortunately, both entered the Silver Dollar while Hector and Gustavo walked to the corner to make a couple of phone calls. The time was now a little bit after 5 p.m. and Ruben would never walk out. As they entered, they hesitated a moment to adjust their eyes to the low lights of the interior of the bar, and Guillermo pointed to a couple of stools immediately to his left and sat down. Amanda came over, and even though she had never seen them before, she knew they were not locals. Guillermo was wearing uh, a tie, and, and he had slick down hair. She knew that he had never been in the bar, but he still looked familiar. Yeah, you see him on TV. Obviously, he was some kind of a professional. Nobody ever wore a tie to the Silver Dollar. The other man was older, heavier, and was wearing a, 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 a light tan shirt and khaki-colored dress pants. They must be connected to the protest, probably cops, she thought. As she wiped the bar, she stared at Guillermo. Excuse me, have I ever seen you before? Before Guillermo could answer, Ruben interrupted and asked for a couple of beers and inquired about the restroom. As he walked, he noticed that it was very quiet in the bar. Usually some ranchera was always bearing away, but the jukebox was not playing, and people were sitting in the booth, were huddled together, almost whispering, including two women and a man at the end of the bar. Ruben returned and sat at Guillermo's right. Outside the bar, Manuel Lopez, middle-aged, shirtless, and wearing a red vest like that kind that of a highway cleanup crews wore, stood in the middle of this intersection, directing traffic, and in halting English, yelled and ordered people to get off the street. Jimmy Flores and his friends Nicholas Clemenko and Tony Sanchez, standing across the street by Green's jewelry store, decided to cross diagonally into an easterly direction in the direction of the Silver Dollar. Lopez spotted them and angrily yelled and ordered them, get off the street. But they ignored the shirtless street volunteer and continued to the front of the bar. And they looked around. Jimmy is 19, Tony is about 17. These are young guys. And they're not going to be at the end of this old crazy guy <laughs> over in the mall. So they was in loco and they just keep going. Uh, Lopez yelled more times and then ran to a group of deputies by Stone Brothers Furniture Store. Jose Naranjo standing in front of the record store, crossed at the same time as Jimmy and his friends and joined them at the entryway of the bar. June Sil Ri, the Korean owner of the wig shop, 
While standing guard outside her shop, watched as several young men congregated in front of the bar and decided to approach them to see what was going on. All of this, by the way, is based on eyewitness testimony of what the people were doing and what the people were saying. Around 4.45, 15 minutes before, now it's from another perspective, before we went into the bar, George Grasser and his partner, James Dawes, from the East LA substation were the first deputies to arrive at the intersection of Laverne and Whittier. As he walked around the area, Grasser felt his mouth and noticed that it was still bleeding. Earlier in Laguna Park, someone had thrown a bottle and hit him in his mouth and it split his, and it split his upper lip. At first he was stunned and didn't realize he was bleeding. The reason I mentioned the bleeding was that the man holding the shotgun is the man that everybody uh, uh, ID, ID, IDs him with blood on his shirt. This is Grasser. He, his mouth has been he bleeds on his shirt. Then later on, he's the man there that I have who's holding the shotgun. And a lot of people believe that he was the man who shot Ruben. You know, I don't know. Uh, a few minutes after Grasser's arrival, another unit parked behind them, and deputies Lambert, Wilson, and Freeman alighted from the cruiser. They had been dispatched from the Montrose substation and arrived in East LA around 4.30 in the afternoon and were assigned to patrol Whittier Boulevard. Wilson brought with him a tear gas gun and several red painted canisters and projectors. They always say the color is important because the only ones that had red painted canisters were the Montrose people. The East LA people had blue painted canisters. So to lay the blame on, on Thomas, they find these red speck uh, paint on Ruben's head, and then they said, see, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, Thomas who did it. Wilson brought with him a tear gas gun and several red painted cancer and projected a CN gas. On the way, they received several calls concerning men with guns, including about uh, one about armed men entering the Silver Dollar. On arrival, Grasser grief, briefly briefed them about the situation at the Silver Dollar, and Wilson put his gun to immediate use by firing several tear gas canister at the crowd of onlookers supposedly threatening the firemen. A short while later, deputies Lewis and Charles Brown Ooh. arrived and parked the car behind them. You see, there's something going on. I mean, people are being diverted and sent to the silver dollar. Not Lopez, they're being sent by headquarters. Why is headquarters doing that? Headquarters is the one that directed people to go to the search station where Ruben is ultimately killed. This is why I don't think it was an accident. I think it was a purposely designed something to happen at, at the Silver Dollar, either to scare the man uh, and maybe it got away from them. I don't know. Uh, a short time later, deputies Lewis and Charles Brown arrived and parked their car behind them, Brasher, Dawes, and the two Browns were the same deputies that earlier had been involved in the confrontation at the Green Mill liquor store that precipitated the whole battle of Laguna Park. And a few minutes later, their actions at the Silver Dollar were all also precipitating the killing of Ruben. When Grasser approached the corner, he noticed a shirtless man in a red vest yelling, monitoring to him and pointing. As he approached, the red vest excitedly informed him that persons with guns went inside the bar. They went inside the bar. He hesitated for a moment, then ran back to his car to make a phone call, informing other units about the impending danger of the Silver Dollar. After struggling with his radio for a few minutes, he made his call, then jumped out and removed his shotgun from the trunk and ran to the corner. He noticed that the two Browns, Lambert, Wilson, and Freeman, were already slowly walking, guns in hand, in a single fire to the front of the Silver Dollar. He joined the slow-moving column, and as he approached the entrance, he pumped his shotgun as I noticed the arm column moving toward the bar. I began to take photos. After making the phone calls, Franco, now another perspective, Franco and Garcia, uh, walked back to the bar, and on the way they noticed a large number of deputies gathering on the burn, while others huddled at the corner, looking and pointing in the direction of the bar. The column of armed deputies began to slowly move in this direction. When they reached the entrance of, of the bar, they made their way through the group. There, a whole bunch of people are there. A group of young men, and Franco quickly parted the curtains and walked in. <clears throat> but Garcia, Garcia, it was that gentleman that you saw in the doorway, that asked Garcia, part of Ruben's crew. Garcia hesitated, turned to see what the deputies were already coming in his direction. Grasser pointed his shotgun hand at him and the others and motioned to them to back up and growl. Quote, if you're reaching for your gun, don't get in. 
get in the bar. Jimmy raised his hands and quickly stepped back. But Garcia hesitated in the entryway and claimed, why? We haven't done anything. We haven't done anything. June, the Korean shopkeeper standing behind the deputy, was startled and screamed and jumped back. Rasser turned to her and yelled, lady, get inside. This gun uh, is loaded and I'm going to use it. She replied, okay, okay, not shoot, please, and rushed into the bar with her hands raised. Still, po still pointing the shotgun, and grasped her angry yell at the man again, get inside, get inside. As I look, as I took pictures of this company, I wonder, why is he pointing the shotgun and why is he ordering him to get into the bar? The people had not done anything wrong. Deputy Louis Brown slowly approached the entrance of the bar uh, uh, Chuck uh, uh, ducked down and speedily crossed the path of the, of the doorway. He claimed that he never saw the confrontation at, at, the door, at, the, at the doorway, but asserted that he yelled several times, come out with your hands up, throw out your weapons. I never heard any warnings from the deputies congregating at the bar entering. Suddenly, Deputy Wilson crouched and fired a tear gas projector into the bar, and moments later fired two more from further back in the entryway. He claimed there were armed men in the bar using guns and this was the humane thing to do, to get them out. People, though, had just entered the bar. Wasn't he afraid that he might hit one of them? Terrif now, from the perspective, terrified, Jimmy raised his hand, and along with Nicholas and Tony, retreated into the bar when Grasser pointed the shotgun at them. June rushed in, hesitated momentarily by the engine, then turned and wisely ran down the aisle to the back door. As he stepped back into the bar, Tony turned and peeked through the curtain and saw Grasser on the right knee still pointing the shotgun and was scared. He quickly closed the curtain and moved back and at the same time Gustavo bolted into the bar and yelled at Hector, who was approaching the bar, don't go out, the police are going to shoot. We have to leave, they're going to shoot. As he rushed in, the curtain flew open and Guillermo and Ruben could clearly see a deputy pointing a shotgun in the doorway. Hector continued to the doorway, parted the curtains and turned and saw policemen with their guns in their hand, and immediately backed away from the entrance. Scared and trembling, Gustavo turned to Ruben. They're going to shoot. They're going to shoot. We have to get out of here. Surprise, Salazar turned and explained. Why? What for? We haven't done anything. Ruben turned on his stool and, and yelled to the deputies, leave us alone. We haven't done anything. A few seconds later, a canister rolled. And, and, and came to rest almost in, at the feet where Ruben and Guillermo were standing. For a second or two, both men stared at the canister before it exploded and began to spew out gas. Ruben yelled, we have to get out of here. Immediately, the circle pointed to the back of the bar and yelled, that's the back way, let's go, let's go. Guillermo yelled at him, come on, come on. Suddenly, there was a thunderous explosion. Smoke began to fill the bar. Almost instantaneously, Guillermo fell to his knees. He thought Ruben had done the same thing. And as the gas filled the room, Guillermo furiously crawled toward the back, motioned with his, with his arm, this way, this way. Moments later, entering the bar, Gustavo saw, this is from another perspective, Gustavo saw a smoke bomb rolling under the curtain, then heard three loud shots, and as he hit the floor, he saw Ruben falling, trying to put his hands in front of him, but wasn't able to, and he fell on his left side and began to shake. He tried to help, but the gas was too strong, and he couldn't see him anymore. A few feet away, Jimmy heard somebody yell, wait then saw a big ball of light and heard what sounded like a pistol shot or a rifle shot. He saw Ruben standing by the door and something hit him and it spun him around and he fell somewhat slumped on his left side in the middle of the aisle on the door and the dirty tile that covered the cement floor. Tony turned and saw Ruben get hit and fall a few feet at the same time that Nicholas heard an explosion and saw the curtain shake and figure fall. Jose heard, Jose heard a very loud shot like a cannon that struck a man on the head who fell like dead weight right in front of him. He couldn't believe it. They had just ordered us in, and then they began to fire. He was stunned. He couldn't move. Suddenly there was a lot of commotion, and people were yelling. They shot him. They shot him. Help us. And another explosion. The gas completely filled the bar, and no one could even open their eyes anymore. At the end of the bar, George, Amanda, and Martha quickly exchanged small talk while they sipped their beers. George heard a commotion, looked up, and saw what appeared to be a small cannon being held by a deputy while the curtain was parted by another deputy. Suddenly he heard a loud explosion and saw particles flying off the head of a man who was sitting in the front of the bar. <clears throat> the man grabbed at his head with his left hand and then fell. Stunned momentarily, George yelled at the friend, let's get out of here, and then ran to the back door as the bar filled with gas. Jimmy yelled at Nicholas and Tony, follow him, and they stumbled down. Guillermo 
crawled until he reached the back door and stumbled out, coughing and crying to clear his throat until he was finally able to breathe fresh air. After a few minutes, he regained his composure and turned around and was going to say something to Ruben, but he was not there. He didn't understand where is he. He looked around and suddenly Franco ran out of the bar. They killed him. They killed Ruben. They shot him. They shot him. They yelled, shut up. You know, that's not true. He didn't die. He, he didn't, he didn't know what to do. He was right behind me. He's alive, he's alive. And don't this time, don't this time. He ran to the exit. He tried to re-enter, but the gas was so overpowering that he had to quickly retreat. All he could see were just a few feet into the bar before choking from the gas. He tried again, took a few steps into the bar, but it was no use. He yelled to the bar, Ruan, Ruan, but no one came out. It was me, it was true. They killed him. After the shooting, the deputy surprised did not go into the bar, but instead backed up and moved away from the entryway. Suddenly, a squad car quickly drove up, parked in front of the bar. Sergeant Laughlin jumped out, conferred with the deputy, went to the entryway, peeked into the bar. He backed up, motioned to the other deputies, and conferred with them again, then got back into his car, made a U-turn park across the street from the bar next to where I was standing. They got out of the bar, and Laughlin quickly fired three more projectors into the entryway of the Civil Dollar. So the first one missed, and a bomb off the wall and gassed the street in front of the bar. People that had gathered to watch the spectacle laughed and made fun of Locke and go ahead and shoot the only Mexicans in there. They shouted sarcastically. Deputy Sparks crossed behind the light standard and fired his 30 year revolver at the, at the open entry. And I still didn't understand why they were shooting that much fire apart. As the deputies continued with the street theater, I walked around and took the pictures. I didn't think there was any danger emanating from the bomb. After firing two more tear gas projectiles, Lachlan used the PA system in the squad car and finally announced, you and the, the bar come out with your hands up. He repeated this warning several more times and I thought, I hope no one comes out. These cops are determined to cool whoever's in there. No one ever came out and at the time I thought that was good. The expert of these deputies like the others involved in the first shooting jumped back into the car and drove away. All that was left was the acrid smell of gas and as I looked at the still smoking and violated little bar, I wondered, what was that all about? Why did they fire? At the back of the bar, Guillermo and his friend walked to the barn where a large number of deputies were congregating and held up a press card. I'm a newsman. My news director, Ruben, was killed. He's inside the barn. One of the deputies angrily approached him and shoved the gun in his face. Get out of here. Move on. But I'm a newsman. I'm a newsman. See, this is my press card. Get out of here. I'm not street penal as I move closer away. It's done. Move. Guillermo was done. Why doesn't he care? As they, as they walk, he approached another deputy and received the same response. Why is this happening? Why don't they want to investigate? He approached the final man. They listened intently and then told him he would, he would find out and he walked away and never returned. Guillermo was now more angry than before. He approached a little house on the side street and asked to use the phone. He called the station and informed the young man that the general manager who had been killed and the sheriff did not want to do anything. Then he told him to return and immediately made calls to the East Los Angeles Sheriff's Station and advised him that one of his men, Ruben Salazar, had been killed in a small bar in Weir and Laverne. He assured that they would investigate and call him later. They never did. Two hours after Thomas Wilson shot into the bar, Julian Garcia, a young Chicano who lived in the area, had been walking around the Silver Dollar and wondered why the deputies had been finding the neighbor bar. He walked toward the back of the bar, placed a wet handkerchief over his face, and began to crawl into the bar. And from the back door, he thought he could see what appeared to be the body of a man toward the front of the bar, but he couldn't, he wasn't sure. He worried that he would be arrested, so he crawled faster into the bar. There was smoke, a sort of fog that hung over most of the bar, but it stung his eye and he was having trouble uh, breathing. His face was hot and his shirt stuck to his back and his tears rolled down his cheek. He finally reached the front of the bar and there he was, <coughs> in his body. The light was dim, but he could clearly see his face. His eyes were closed and he was lying on his side. He actually looked quite peaceful, like he was asleep. He didn't have a wound, and there was no blood on his face or anywhere around his body on the floor around him. Julian bent over him and extended his hand and pleaded, hey man, come on, let's go, get up. We have to, we have to get out of here. When he didn't move, he reached over to wake him and he felt his face. It was cold. It suddenly occurred to him, he must be dead. He's dead. He was confused. He had never been close to a dead body and he certainly had never talked to one. He didn't know what to do, but he bent over again and made the sign of the cross. He was going to try to drag him out, but he began to cough, and his eyes swelled with tears. He covered his mouth and nose with a handkerchief and turned, and this time he didn't crawl. He ran outside the bar. He bent over and tried to cough out the smell of the gas and the death. 
After arriving at the station, Guillermo and his friend excitedly explained everything that had happened. Danny calmed them and once again called the deputy. My news director, Salazar, he was killed in the civil dollar. Please investigate. Curiously, he was told no report had ever come about any shooting at the, at the intersection and didn't even have a record of it earlier calls. They said they would call in and on the matter, they never did. In the middle of a small bar in East LA, Ruben Salazar lay on the cold, hard floor of the Silver Dollar Cafe. He was dying and he was alone and he tried to crawl, but for some reason he couldn't move. He heard his name from a distance, but where was he? Why was his face cold? cold and why couldn't he breathe? He tried to move his arm to touch his face, but he couldn't. He tried to speak, to yell, but nothing came out. He heard his name again, but this time it was much further away. He sailed rapidly several times. It was getting dark and he was going around in circles. Then suddenly there was a light. He could breathe. It was all right. Uh, it was no longer cold. The sheriff's department promised to enforce Sally that her husband had been killed, but they never did. She learned that Ruben had been killed uh, as she watched the 10 o'clock news that night. 40 miles away from the Silver Dollar Sally, Sally, she gathered her three children around her and began to cry. Stephanie was seven, and Lisa was eight, and John was five. Two weeks later, at the Silver Dollar, at the Sacred Heart of El Paso, Texas, at the church of the, of the Sacred Heart of Paso, Ruben's crying mother, Luz Chavez de Salazar, made the following statements. Ruben lo asesinaron. Todo estaba preparado. Claro que es difícil probarlo, pero todo tendió a eliminarlo por la, la, la campaña que se llama en beneficio de los México americanos. Además, a mí lo dejaron tirado en el mar. Más de siete horas, mientras que se, se, sus compañeros afuera le decían a, a los, a los, eh, a, a, a todos los sostenían con raya de pistola, pese que los compañeros de Rubén decían, los policías, Rubén está dentro, Rubén está dentro. Mi hijo lo asesinaron. No estoy acusando a nadie de concreto, pero a mi hijo lo eliminaron. In English, Ruben was assassinated. This is Ruben's mother. Ruben was assassinated. Everything was prepared. Clearly, it is difficult to prove, but everything indicated that he was eliminated for his campaign on behalf of the Mexican American and Mexicans. Also, my son was left lying on the floor of the bar where he sought refuge for more than six hours while his colleagues that were away that they, they, they were kept in detention at the point of a gun, even though they kept saying to the police, Ruben inside, Ruben is inside. My son was assassinated. I'm not accusing anyone in particular, but my son was assassinated, and I say she was right. Anyway, that's my story. I just want to show just a few of the street. I know you've been here a long time, but just to see, these are fantastic. These are photos that have never been seen before. Uh, the, the bar has been cleaned. This is the tear gas. This, these are the shell. These are the, are the, um, the so-called fins. They come out of the back. Uh, you know, they're expanded. You know, there's more shots there at the back of the bar. Another shell. This is, this is a shot that was shot by somebody, like about that same day, this is the way the bar looked that evening after the, after the killing of Ruben, I think the next day, shot like through a hole in the doorway. Does anyone have any questions? This is Peter Hernandez, and he's inside the bar that they're cleaning. This is not a pool of blood. He's cleaning the bar, and, but he's looking down where Ruben was killed. Where he, where he laid, his body laid. This is supposedly Ruben's body being taken out. And this is another big mystery. That's not a body. They're taking out something, and it's covered, but that's not a body, folks. That's not a body. Something is on that, on that thing, and it's, uh, this is the end of the, this is the end of the uh, thing here. There's no head. Uh, it just, it just it comes, and I've asked people about it, I said, no, nobody. Like, somebody's been carried out, but not a body. 
at any rate, that's one of the shots that follows also. Uh, this is the search certificate. It's homicide. It's homicide. Is what it said. Uh, anyway, I want to show. You must have some questions. If you have one. Yeah. Do you have the picture of, of uh, the autopsy of the They didn't release those. There's no. Those folders are not here either. I saw them. Yeah, I, I saw them also. And uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't know what you saw, but that was not Ruben. You might have saw somebody that you thought was looking like Ruben, but as far as I'm concerned, that was not Ruben. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, it was, you know, it was kind of you know, you talk about the head, uh, you know, how the head was damaged uh, uh, pretty, so pretty severely. I saw his body laying on the silver dollar, supposedly with, mind you, I saw, I, I saw pictures of Ruben at the sheriff's hand where he's laying there at the body, where he's laying, where he's shot with a huge pool of blood. No, I, I don't know. no blood on the stools, no blood on the bar, there's no blood spatter anywhere. It's not true, it's bogus and phony. That, that whole scene at the bar where that body is laying is a phony picture. And if you saw it and you didn't see that it was, there was no blood spatter anywhere. If I get shot in the head, there's going to be blood spatter everywhere. No, okay. When you see the pictures on this thing, the only blood is on the floor. On the floor. Like it's lying around him. Like I said, somebody just poured the blood on him. I, I think the pictures that I saw that were taken, they were taken at the coroner's office. I saw them inside the bar. Okay, you saw them. I saw, uh, I saw his body inside the bar. And, and as far as I'm, and I saw the autopsy photos also. The, the, the pictures of the bar make no sense. Because if somebody shoots you, it's gonna be the blood spatter is gonna you know, the blood spatter is gonna go everywhere, the blood's gonna shoot out, it's gonna even hit the ceiling. Nothing is on the bar. You saw the bar, there was no blood there. You saw the side where the where the where Ruben is lying there and you can see that there's a whole pool of blood. I, when I was looking at the picture, I said, look at the look at the chair, look at the legs of that chair, where his body, his head is bleeding. Not a single drop of blood. What about the mortician? Well, the mortician...